Okay, I'm going to go over everything that you need to know for this chapter on forces. So for, for my course, um, really the first topic is forces. Uh, if you are in another algebra-based physics courses, often you might start with kinematics. You know, this is kinematics, x equals x naught plus v naught t plus one half a t squared, all that kind of stuff. But this book that I'm using, uh, I'm actually, for this semester, I'm using uh, John Batista's College Physics 5th edition, and it starts off with forces in, in actually chapter 2, chapter 1's units and stuff like that. So I'm going to go over all the big ideas in this chapter, uh, and, and there's a lot of stuff here, but I'm not going to solve problems, and I'm not going to focus a lot on vectors, because I already have a video about vectors, and I'll link that down below. Uh, so let's get started. Forces. When you think about physics, you know, it's, it's about how do we describe uh, things that move uh, or things that interact in some way. And, and one way to describe these interactions is with forces. So let me just go ahead and start off with, from what we understand right now, there's, there's essentially four fundamental interactions. And so we have uh, the fundamental interactions are gravity, which there's some stuff with that, okay? I, I don't want to get into it. Uh, there's the electromagnetic, there's the strong nuclear, strong nuclear, and there's weak nuclear, weak. So, and, and as far as we understand, everything that we know is some one of these, okay? So let's start with gravity. If I have two objects, and they both have mass, there's an attractive force between these two. So gravity is an interaction between any objects that have mass, and it's an attractive force. Yeah. And we're going to talk about gravity quite a bit in this chapter, so I'll get back to this. The electromagnetic, so this goes right here. The electromagnetic is an interaction between electric charges, and sometimes those charges can be moving. And so that's, if, if it's just two electric charges, it's, a, it's an electric force. If one of them is moving, or actually both of them are moving, then they can make magnetic forces too. Uh, but that's that's that. So these, these are fundamental properties of particles. Mass is a fundamental property of particles. Charge, electric charge is a fundamental property of particles. So these two are, you know, very fundamental and very important. We're not going to look a lot at electromagnetic interactions. That's really reserved for the second part, the second semester of the course. Uh, so in, what we, we do kind of, because a lot of the forces that you're going to look at are actually electromagnetic forces, even though we don't treat them as that. And I'll, I'll explain that in a little bit. Okay, now we have the strong nuclear force. Um, so if you take something like uh, a helium atom, okay, a helium atom looks like this. It's got two protons, but those protons have the same charge, and so they repel very, very strongly when they're that close together. So there's actually also a unstable helium. The nucleus also has two neutrons. So it has two protons and two neutrons, and, and then it has, some, uh, has two electrons out here, but they're just kind of, you know, chilling over here. But the important thing is how do these things stay together? Well, it turns out that although there is a very, very large electro electric force push repelling these there has to be a stronger force pulling them together and that's the strong force it's an interaction between these particles like protons and neutrons uh, and the neutrons do exert a strong force even though they're neutral uh, the weak the weak force um, everyone always makes a joke uh, let's just not talk about that because it is really complicated I mean these things even this strong nuclear force I can give an explanation of it uh, but it's, and, and it may be better to think of it as a weak interaction, the strong interaction. And, and we, can, we can describe these as forces, but they're really, they're really interactions. You know, there's no such thing as a force. It's just what we use to describe these interactions. 
It's a model to describe them. Just like the word F-O-R-C-E-S is something that we made up. It's not really real. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. So what? So we're going to focus mostly on gravity and other types of forces right here. Okay. <clears throat> I'm going to get into those in just a little bit. Uh, let's talk about units uh, really quickly. In, in this course, we're going to use the units for force. Every, every measurement has units, and it's going to be uh, measured in newtons. So what, what's a newton? Well, I mean, <clears throat> if, you, if you get like a textbook, okay, um, yeah, a, you know, a normal-sized textbook, and you lift it up, and you have to hold it with your hand, you can feel that. That's, that's on the order of 10 newtons. So if you have your hand over here, that's my hand, and a textbook, then you have to push up with about 10 newtons, just so you can see what that would be. And, th and that's just a rough approximation. Of course, all textbooks are different. Okay. Now, in the imperial units, uh, which I would, we're not really going to use, the unit of force is pounds. Okay. And there is a conversion between those two, but I don't really care. I'm, I'm going to stick with uh, newtons. Okay, let's talk about uh, <clears throat> Newton's three laws of motion. Okay, everyone loves to do this. I'm going to run out of paper. I should have thought beforehand. So let's call this, and you know, I, I think that people overemphasize this, but it's important to discuss it. So let's say Newton's laws. It's in the book, and you want to talk about it anyway. Newton's laws. Okay, before we do that, let's talk about this other guy. He looks like this. And I'm sorry that it's, they're all guys. I don't know what to do about that. Okay. Uh, and, and, I, and in fact, I suspect that there are other people. It's just that history recognizes this guy. His name is Aristotle. So I'm going to draw a picture of him. So he's, he's Greek. And he has, you know, like hair. And he's got like a beard. You know, they always show him with a beard. Uh, and he's got like... You know, he's wearing, they always show him with these robes. There, that's my Aristotle. So Aristotle was a philosopher, a Greek philosopher. Uh, and, and, you know, we're talking about the, on the order of 350 B.C. So this is sometime around that time. Now, one of the things that he did, you know, they, they weren't exactly scientists as what we call scientists today. You know, they would observe things and then kind of... Uh, just think about what that might mean. Uh, scientists nowadays would base our ideas on experiments. And, and they, would, they would observe things, but then after that they would say, well, it just makes sense. Okay, so it was a logical-based philosophy. One of the things that uh, Aristotle did, I guess I should write his name up here, Aristotle, was he broke things into really five elements. So we have the five elements, earth, water, air, fire. Uh, and then there's the ether, too. I, I can't remember how they spell it. E ether? Eather? I don't know. We'll talk about that in a second. So for... These elements are kind of important because those, everything is made up of those things and they all have their place, okay? And so objects want to go where they belong. So earth and water go down. They belong down, right? And fire and earth belong up. They, they rise. And then the aether is for heavenly bodies, for planets and stuff like that. That's something different, okay? So... If you take something like a rock, and this is not a rock, this is a piece of Lego, but I'm just using it as a demonstration of the green looks a little bit better. Uh, and it wants to go down. So once it's down as far as it goes on this, on this table, it stops. And that's cool. It's happy. It's at its natural state. If I lift it up and let it go, it returns to its natural state, which is down. Okay. Now, there's actually two kinds of motion. There's the, the natural motion... And you may think, who cares about philosophy? This is dumb. Get to the physics. Well, it does matter. I'll tell you why. But there's the natural motion. Nat 
droll. That's what this is. It goes where it wants to be. And then there's violent motions. So a violent motion is when I do to this what it doesn't want to do. It wants to sit there at rest, not moving. So if I push it, I'm changing its state. I'm, I'm doing what it doesn't want to do. It doesn't want, it wants to stay there and I'm making it, I'm moving it. Okay. So I'm, I'm being violent to this Lego. But as soon as I stop pushing it, it stops. Right? It returns to its natural state. And that's it. The natural state natural state is at rest. So if you leave something alone, it's going to go back to the way it was, natural state. Okay. That's important. That's really important because we think of that now. Most people think of that. If, you know, when you say what happens when you stop pushing on this, they'll say, well, it stops. And that makes sense. Okay, so the ideas of Aristotle make a lot of sense, and that's important. Because 2,000 years later, around uh, 1700, we have this guy. I'm going to draw him. He's got like this. The pictures I always show him with like uh, big eyebrows. And then he's got like that, that classic 1700s hair. Uh, and then he's wearing a... He's wearing a, 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 a you know, a collared shirt or something. And this is Newton, Isaac Newton. And there's actually others before him, uh, but but these, these are called Newton's laws. So let's talk about that. Um, there, there was Galileo who did a lot of important work. Uh, and But let's just jump to Newton's three laws of motion because they deal with, they're really, they're really talking about Aristotle. Uh, so in this chapter, um, it really focuses more on Newton's first and third law, uh, but there but there are three. So uh, first law, let's put it over here. Let's call it Newton one. Newton Newton's first law says, and you don't, I don't expect you to memorize the order of these. I'm just trying to tell you where they come from, and and people put a lot of emphasis on this, which I don't think they should. Okay, but Newton's first law says Aristotle's wrong. That's the new first law. Aristotle said if you leave an object alone, it stops. Newton says if you leave an object alone, it remains at a constant velocity. Okay, so this, this is uh, no force equals constant velocity. Which could be a velocity of zero at rest is fine. So if, you, if it's not moving and you leave it alone, it stays not moving. If it's moving at a constant speed and you leave it alone, it, it keeps moving at a constant speed. Okay, and which doesn't seem doesn't seem to work, but it does because you know we have these other forces that we'll talk about in here like friction. Okay, so once I leave the, if I stop pushing it, it's not being left alone. There is friction interacting with it. So that's the problem. Galileo kind of addressed this problem by by. Uh, having a ramp at a very shallow angle and rolling balls down it. Okay. And that way you could measure the speed, the speed changes of the balls and stuff like that. Uh, it was a really clever idea. Uh, but Newton's first law says that Aristotle's wrong. The natural state of motion is at rest and that's that. Okay. So, and if you think about it that way, because it, it, it kind of Newton's first law and second law, a lot of times seem like they're the same thing. So here's the second law to have room. Let's see if it goes on here. Okay, N2. This is called N2. This says, I'm going to write it the way the book writes it. It says this. And, and in fact, it doesn't really do this in chapter 2. It saves it for later. But this says that if you take all the forces acting, uh, acting on an object, not so that sum that sigma means, that means add up all the forces, that's the sum of the forces. That's going to be equal to the mass times acceleration. Now, we didn't define acceleration, but the acceleration is the change in velocity over the change in time. Uh, this is the algebra-based course, so we're not going to do it as a derivative. And so here you see, if I go back up here, if the velocity is constant, then the change in velocity is zero, the acceleration is zero, and there's no net force. So this is kind of redundant uh, to, to think of it this way. This is your classic F equals MA, right? even though don't say it like this is the net force is mass and acceleration and these are vectors okay which is important we'll talk about vectors in just a second um, so 
so these two are the same thing, but this is really there because of Aristotle, right? Because it's to say, because this is 2,000 years later, 2,000 years, right? Uh, 350 to 1700. And in those 2,000 years, people were like, Aristotle's the, the dude, man. He's the dude. Whatever he said, I'm going with him. And so when Newton had to kind of battle that and say, well, hey, let's, let's chill out for a second, okay? And maybe that's not right. So uh, that's Newton's first and second law. His third law in three, forces come in pairs. So this one's kind of hard to understand, um, but let me, let me do it as a, as a different way. So here is, so I live down here. I'm gonna mess it up a little bit. That's, that's Louisiana, it kind of looks like that. So I live right around here. This is in Hammond. Uh, you could go over here to Baton Rouge. And if you drove this way west, it's almost straight west. It's, I don't know, maybe 50 miles, right? So it's 50 miles west from Hammond to Baton Rouge. Well, how far is it from Baton Rouge to Hammond? Well, it's 50 miles, right? It's the same thing. It's just you're going east. So 50 miles west from Hammond to Baton Rouge. 50 miles east from Baton Rouge to Hammond. It's really the distance between Baton Rouge and Hammond that matters, right? You have to have two places to have a distance. And so here we have Hammond to Baton Rouge. And that's what Newton's third law says. It says that forces are an interaction between two things. Uh, so if, if A pushes on B, if I go over here, here's uh, um, two planets, A and B. If A pulls on B, then B pulls on A. And we'll talk about this more later. Okay. Now, but here, I do want to say one thing because it comes up. If I go 50 miles east from Hammond, I will end up, let's say, in uh, probably it's close to Mandeville, but I don't know. So Mandeville. So if I go 50 miles west from Baton Rouge, from Hammond, I end up at Baton Rouge. 50 miles east from Baton Rouge, I'll end up in Mandeville. This, these two are not distance pairs, right? They just happen to be equal and opposite distances, but they, they're not between Baton Rouge and Hammond. It's another place. And the same thing comes up with forces. People say, oh, that force is the exact opposite of this force. They must be pairs. No. This is B acting on A, A acting on B. And that's Newton's third law. He says that forces are an interaction between two objects. And we, draw, we put those in pairs. Okay, how am I doing on time? So I'm not doing too bad. Okay, so let's talk about free body. Uh, no. Let's talk about the kinds of forces. Because really we want to look at special forces. So kinds of forces. I'm going to have to get more paper. So we have two kinds. Long range and contact. So long range forces are forces between two objects in which they do not have to touch. So the most obvious of these is the gravitational force. Right, because if I take my Lego block and I let go, it's interacting with the Earth. Those are the two objects, the Earth and the block, but they don't touch. Right, but there's still there's an, there's an interaction between those without touching. Um, the other is the electrostatic, or this is called electric, magnetic. You can break those into two two kinds, but they're really the same thing, and they don't have to touch. Contact forces are actually much more difficult. They do have to touch. So in this semester of physics, really the only long range force you're probably going to see is gravitational force. So let me list some contact forces. Um, surfaces. And we call it, we actually call this the normal force. So a normal force is a force that's perpendicular to the surface. Okay, and I'll draw that in a little bit. Uh, friction. We're going to talk about that. Uh, tension in a string. So if I pull on a string. Uh, springs, which we'll get to later. That's a really important force. Uh, air resistance is complicated, but we'll talk about it for sure. So this is the force 
uh, when you move through the air, you can feel the air pushing on your hand the faster you move, and that's a force air resistance. Uh, you could, uh, uh, let's call this a push. You know, if I push something with my finger, that's a, that's a contact force. Now, you know, that is a fundamental force. That's a fundamental force. That's a fundamental force. We showed those. But what about all these? What kind of forces are these? And they're actually this. Just about all of them are this. I think they all are. They're all electric forces. Because as, as I move my finger closer to this Lego brick, the... And, and this is kind of crazy to think about it. But the, the atoms in my finger interact with the atoms in the Lego block. And so this has protons and neutrons and electrons, and this has protons, neutrons, and electrons. And it's actually a repulsive electric force. I mean, we think we're touching it, but we're really, you could, it depends on how you define touching. Uh, you, could, you could argue that we're not actually touching it, but there is an interaction. Okay, and, and that's not super important, except to, to realize that these are just approximations of an actual electric force. Okay, where to now? I guess we should talk about uh, free, let's just jump into free body diagrams. Let's just do it. So what we do in this chapter, I'm just gonna say FBD, free body diagrams. We are dealing with situations where this, this net force on an object is equal to zero. We call this equilibrium. If you haven't looked at my video on vectors, you know, there's nothing wrong with pausing this and going to that video and coming back. I'm cool with that. I'm going to give you a super brief review, but uh, when I draw an arrow over a symbol, that means it's a vector. That means it has more than one piece of information. Okay, time, temperature, mass, they're just one thing. It doesn't matter which way they're going. But forces, if I push, if I push this Lego piece this way, and I push it that way, those are two different interactions, right? Because they're going in two different directions. So I have to take that into account. I have to, to deal with that direction when I talk about forces. And that's why these are vectors. This just says uh, that if the total force, the sum of the forces on an object is equal to zero, then that object stays at rest. No, that object doesn't accelerate. Okay, it could be moving at a constant velocity. Okay, that's the important thing. So how do we how do we do that? We want to draw. Let's let's talk about vectors. Super brief introduction to vectors. Uh, again, see the video down below. So let's say I have a force, and this is the x and the y direction, and here's my force like this. I didn't put it at the origin because it doesn't have to be. How do I represent that force? Well, it has some magnitude and it has some direction, um, and and so I can actually represent that as a sum of two forces, fx, x hat, and it's green, fy, y hat, such that I can write, and this is, I'm just going to do it in two dimensions, f equals fx, x hat, plus fy, y hat. So what does that mean? This x hat just means a unit vector in the direction of x, the x-axis, which I picked this way, but I could pick whichever way I want. You, you don't want to change it in the middle of the problem, but you can pick whatever direction you want. And y hat's a vector in the direction of the y-axis. Um, and these are how much of that force is in the x direction. So let me draw a bigger, a bigger uh, picture of that at a different angle. If, let's say this has a magnitude of 10 and this is an angle of 35 degrees. Well, if this, since X and Y are always perpendicular, then I have a right triangle. So that means that down here I can say FX, the magnitude of this side is going to be 10 times cosine of 35, right? Because cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse, so I can solve that for adjacent and I get that. And the same thing for the Y. Fy is 10 sine 35. So I can find these components and, and that really makes it easy to deal with adding up vectors, right? Because what if I have more than one force? What if I have two forces? Here's another force, F, call it F1, 
F2, then F total is, I, I usually write it as F net, because I just like that better. It would be F1x plus F2x x hat plus F1y plus F2y y hat. So I take the components and add them together, and that gives me this sum for the x and the sum for the y. And again, I hate to say this again, but I don't want to have, I made a, a long video on vectors, so I don't want to go into this in too depth, adding up vectors. Okay, let's draw a free body diagram. And yes, I have now run out of paper. Let me grab some paper. So let's draw the simplest diagram that we can, a block sitting on a table or the ground. So let's say that I want to represent the diagrams on this, and I probably should draw talk about the gravitational force first. So let, let me draw a simple force diagram. Uh, we'll talk about the gravitational force, and then we'll go back and draw a more complicated diagram, and then we'll talk about friction, and I think then we'll be happily finished. Um, okay, so I know that this block is at rest. That means I know the net force acting on it has to be equal to zero. So what is there? Well, there's the downward gravitational force. So I'm going to draw a dot in the middle of my object. I'm going to draw the force right there. I'm going to call this Fg. That's the gravitational force pulling down. And so I'm rep representing my uh, force as an arrow and the direction of the arrow is the direction of the force, and the length of the arrow is proportional, proportional to the direction, I mean the magnitude of that. Uh, so I, since I know this is at rest, then there has to be some other force pushing up to make the total force equal to zero. So I have also, uh, it's gonna be the same length, and I'm gonna call that in the normal force. So that's my free body diagram right there. Now I can say, F net is going to be equal to N plus FG equals zero. So there's really some important things here. Number one, it's plus. You add up the forces. And you may say, whoa, 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 wait, what the heck? That one's going down, it should be negative. No, well, one, I never even said which way the x and y axis was, right? So that could be in the x direction. You don't know that. But two, it may have a negative y component of the force, but it's still, we're adding up the vectors. Okay, so it's just a positive y component, a negative y component, but the vector itself, we're adding up the vectors. This is some of the vectors, okay? The next thing is this, zero. Uh, so this is the zero vector. I cannot have one side of an equation equal to uh, a vector and the other side equal to a scalar. That's impossible. Okay, so we write the zero vector. So now I can, let's go ahead and write the zero vector as this, plus zero y hat, plus zero z hat. That's the most, that's the way this book writes vectors. Uh, I like to write it as zero equals zero, 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 and this is, that's just a zero vector. It doesn't have to have units. Okay. Uh, so this is the x, y, and z component with angle brackets. That's how, one way to describe a vector too. Uh, you could use also i hat, j hat, k hat. I think the book uses x hat, y hat, z hat. But that is the different than the number zero, right? Because this is zero in three directions, which seems crazy, but it's important. Okay, uh, let's do one other thing. What if I take my finger and I push down on it. Well, that's a pretty good pic picture right there. Uh, so in that case, I'm gonna have another force, and how do I deal with that? Well, I can add it, I could put it right here on the side, or I can put it down here. I'm gonna go ahead and put it uh, right down here. Now let's put it right there. And let's call this FP for the finger push. But now my diagram is going to have to change. My equation is going to have to change. So down here, I'm going to say F net equals N plus FG plus FP 
equals zero. And since I have an extra downward force pushing, I'm gonna have to have this normal force is gonna have to push up even harder. So that, that means this is gonna have to increase up to there so that the total pushing up and the total pushing down are the same. This is one of the things that's weird about most of these contact forces is there's no equation, right? They are technically called forces of constraint. The force that pushes up does whatever it needs to do to make that block stay on the table, okay? Now, if I push with 80 bajillion newtons down, the table can't push up that hard and the table just breaks. Okay, so it can only do so much. If I take this finger away and this force doesn't go back to what it was, then there'd be a greater force up than down and it would accelerate up. And we don't see that, right? I don't see this and then it stays there. So we don't see that. So the table has to push exactly the right amount or that table, this, this will not stay where it's at. And that's why it's a force of constraint. Okay, let's talk about gravity. So here's the Earth. Kind of. Um, that's Florida. Let's see. And not drawn to scale. And then here is a spacecraft. It's got solar panels. So this has a mass, mass of the Earth. This is a mass, uh, let's call it MS. And so since both of these have a mass, there is a gravitational force interaction between them. And it depends on the distance between their centers, we will call that R. So it turns out that the magnitude of the force on the satellite is equal to this. F we'll call it big G, it's going to be big G, mass of the Earth, mass of the satellite, over R squared. Now, you'll notice that this is not a vector equation. That's not a vector. That's not a vector. Okay. I'm going to show you how to do it as a vector, uh, but we're going to make situations such that we can avoid doing that if we have to. Okay. So let's talk about the different parts. G is the universal gravitational constant. So G has a value of 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11th newtons meter squared per kilogram squared. So if I put this in up here and I multiply by kilogram squared divided by meter squared, I get newtons. That's just the gravitational constant. That's just an experimental thing that we determine that works everywhere. Okay, what about the mass of the Earth? Um, I forget this. I think, was it 5.9 times 10? Let me look it up. It's okay to look up stuff. Um, mass of Earth in kilograms. So the mass of the Earth is 5.972 times 10 to the 24th kilograms. And then let's look up the radius of the Earth. That six is a 6.3 times 10 to the 6 radius. In meters. In meters, not miles. Meter. I put in meters in M and it gave me miles. 6.371. 6.371 times 10 to the 6th meters. And so you'll notice here that scientific notation, scientific notation, sci we, we have to deal with this in scientific notation. Okay, so let's say that this is uh, satellite. Oh, we need a mass for the satellite. Let's say the mass of the satellite is 100 kilograms. Uh, and we're going to calculate the magnitude of that force. How, we need to know how far away it is. Let's say it's twice uh, r is 2 times the radius of the Earth. So let's just calculate that force. So Fg is going to be equal to 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11th times the mass of the Earth. I'm going to, oops, I'm going to, I'm going to curve this down so I don't hit that. That was dumb of me. Uh, 5.972 times 10 to the 24th. I'm going to leave off the units. Uh, 100. All that over 6.371. I have two of those, right? So two times. 
times 10 to the sixth, and then all of that squared. Okay, let's just go ahead and put this in our calculator, and this will be a great practice for dealing with calculators. Uh, I, I personally like to use Python, but let's do it. And I, here's my uh, very inexpensive calculator. I'm not really great at calculators. I don't really use them, uh, but this is a great opportunity to practice. Uh, this is the TI-30X2S. Um, I like this one because it's cheap and it does everything you need to do. Okay, so let's just put in our values up here. Uh, 6.67, and then scientific notation, second EE, e, and then I'm gonna say negative 11 times this, 5.972, scientific notation, 24 times 100, divided by parentheses, 2 times 6.371 scientific notation 6 close parentheses squared enter I did that all at once so I have 245 I think that's right seems right Newton's Okay, let me give you a different version of that force. Um, let's say I'm over here and want to find the gravitational force, and R is a vector. In that case, I can find the uh, unit vector, R hat. Now, so I, I, in my class, the only cases I'll have this happen are if R hat is in the, if R is in the X or Y direction to make it as simple as possible, um, or Z. So, but if I do that, I can write this, Fg equals negative g, mass of the Earth, mass of the satellite, r hat over the magnitude of r squared, right? So I can't square r because it's a vector, but if I take the magnitude of it, I can. And then I can, multi if I include this unit vector, then I get another vector. And the negative sign just means that it's in the opposite direction of r. And, but that's the force on the satellite. I actually can find the force on the Earth due to the satellite because remember Newton's third law said that forces are an interaction between two things. So that would just be F, let's call it Earth, is going to be equal to G M E M S over R hat, R squared, R hat. Okay, one more thing with gravity, then we'll talk about friction. Um, let's say we go back to our Earth, and then here's my, there's my Earth. What if I put the satellite right here such that the radius of the Earth is equal to R? If you do that, and I'm going to leave this as a homework assignment for you. If I do this, FG equals uh, G M E M S over the radius of the Earth squared, I can actually write this as G M E over the radius of the Earth squared times M S. And this value, G M E over R E squared, is equal to 9.8 newtons per kilogram. And it turns out if you if you move this um, up a thousand meters, well, you don't really change. You don't really change r right this is six times ten to the six plus a thousand and it's about the same so if you're on the surface of the earth we can actually use this f g equals m g where g is the gravitational field and it has a value zero negative nine point eight zero newtons per kilogram near the surface of the earth okay so it makes it a lot more a lot simpler to find the gravitational uh, force near the Earth. Okay, and go ahead and do that. Put in these numbers, make sure you do get around 9.8. 9.8, 9.81, 9 whatever. It does vary as you move around the Earth because masses change and so forth like that. Okay, let's talk about friction and then I will let you go because uh, I'm sure you're tired of listening to me talk and I'm cool with that. So, if I go over here, and I push with one Newton to the side. Let's draw a free body diagram for that. So here's my, here's my 
surface. Here's my block. I know I have the gravitational force. I'll just write that as mg. We already said that. I have a normal force pushing up. And then let's say I push it uh, this way, fp. So here I go. One newton. It's not one newton. Okay, but let's say that it is. It didn't move, so that means it stayed at rest. And that, me that means that f net has to be zero. Now, there's, these two forces could, could cancel, but there, there's something in the, in the x direction, let's call that the x, not the y, that has to compensate for this, and that is the friction force, f friction. Now, if I push with a 2 Newton force, then that for, and it still doesn't move, then that had to increase too. Okay, so we call this static friction. So we can model the magnitude of the static friction force as the following. F friction static is less than or equal to the coefficient of static friction times the normal force. So this is, uh, this is the Greek letter mu, and S stands for static. This is the coefficient of static friction. And N is the normal force. So what this says is that the harder these two surfaces are pushed together, if I push down on this and I compress these two against each other, then you can get a greater frictional force. But this less than or equal to sign means that that's not always the frictional force, right? Because if this is, if I don't push very hard, then this is going to match it. This tells you how hard you can push before you make it move, accelerate. Okay. And it depend, this coefficient of friction depends on the types of surfaces. You have to look it up. So um, steel on glass is going to be different than wood on wood or rubber on asphalt. They all have different coefficients of friction. And this is a scalar equation because the normal force is that way. The friction force is parallel to the surface. Okay. This also pushes in the opposite direction to make the two surfaces stationary. Okay, so if I, if I switch this and I now push that way, the frictional force is going to push the opposite way too. That's static friction. Now, at, certain, at a certain point, I can get this to start sliding, and then there's another force. We call that kinetic friction, and it looks like this. Uh, F, F, K equals mu K in. So that's the coefficient of kinetic friction, and it's constant now, right? There's just some constant value. These are both just models. They're not perfect models, um, but they are indeed models. Okay, let's do one last thing. Let's draw a free body diagram for a block on an incline. And I'm going to solve some problems later. This is just, uh, just a warm-up. So let's say this block is sitting on this incline uh, some angle theta, and it just stays there. What force is reacting on it? Let's see, I have the downward gravitational force, mg. It's pulling towards the Earth, which is down. I have the normal force, which is perpendicular to that surface. And then I have a frictional force, which is parallel to the surface and wants to make it stay stationary, F, F. Let's just call it F. If it's at rest, then I know the following has to be true. F net equals N plus the frictional force plus the gravitational force equals zero. Now, I want to get a relationship between the components of these. And to do that, I have to pick an X and a Y direction, right? And so in this case, if you look N is that way and F is that way. If I pick this as my x-axis and this is my y-axis, then these two are either in the x and y axis directions and I'll have one that has multiple components. So let's do that. Um, let's write F net X and F net Y. So if you play over with, with some geometry, this is 90 degrees. That's theta. So that has to be the complement of theta. But this is 90 degrees, and that's the complement of theta, so this has to be theta. So if I look at the x direction, let's say f net x, it's going to be equal to uh, which forces are acting in the x direction. Well, part of the gravitational forces, if I redraw just that force, 
Oh, I should draw it more carefully. So that's my gravitational force, mg. I want to find this part. And you'll notice that it's the opposite side of that angle. So I'd use the sine of that ang of this angle to get this component. So the, and it's in the positive x direction. So I'm going to say mg sine of theta. That's the x component of the gravitational force, which may seem weird, right? Because like it's gravity, it's in the y direction. No, we moved our axis. OK. Now I have the frictional force in the negative F, x direction, FF. And that has to add up to 0. So that's one equation. Now for the y direction, I'm going to say F net y is going to be equal to, I have the normal force in the y direction, n. And you notice I, these are scalars now because I'm just dealing with the components. And I have the, uh, horiz the adjacent component, this side. Okay, so that's going to be minus mg cosine theta. So why is it minus? Because it's in the negative y direction. Why is it cosine? Because I'm dealing with the adjacent part of that. And that equals 0. Now, I actually can make this a little bit better because I know that um, if, let's say, it's just on the verge of sliding. It's just about to slide. So I'm at the maximum frictional force. So I can say F friction max is equal to the coefficient of friction times the normal force. So if I use this up here, I can plug that in and I can solve this for n. So let's solve this for n. I get n equals mg cosine theta, right? I just add mg to cosine theta to both sides. And if I put this in for that, I have mu s times mg cosine theta, and then I put this in for that. And I get mg sine theta minus the frictional force, which is mu times n, but that's n, so I get minus mu s mg cosine theta equals 0. Now, I can cancel some stuff. I can divide both sides by mg. So if I divide this by mg, I get 0. If I divide that by mg, those things go away. Now I'm going to add this to both sides, and I get mu s cosine theta equals sine theta. And then I can divide both sides by cosine. I get mu s equals sine theta over cosine theta equals tangent theta. So this is, this is you see this a lot. The coefficient of friction is equal to the tangent theta. Now this is only for the case where it's at the maximum frictional force. And it's only in the case where there's no other forces on it. So don't, don't take this and say that's absolutely true. It's a result of this problem, OK? But it's not absolutely true. OK, I'm tired. I don't know about you. I'm going to stop there. 48-minute uh, video. Uh, that's your introduction to forces. Uh, and I'm going to solve some problems later. OK, that's it.